Hi, I'm Maya Shitreet, and um, I have good news and I have bad news. I'm going to start with the bad news. The bad news is I'm a rule breaker, a little bit of a rule breaker. That might make some of the proper Brits in the audience a little uncomfortable. But the good news is that being a rule breaker means that I think outside the box, and I think what we're going to learn in the course of this panel of rule breakers <laughs> is that we need to start to welcome a new way, and that's going to take breaking some of the rules that we have in place right now. So I want to start, um, I want to take you to a place about five years ago when um, I was lying in bed and I opened my eyes and I wiped copious sweat from my face because I was in a very humid environment and I untangled myself from a whole mass of mosquito netting, stepped out of bed and walked outside being careful not to step on any exotic or poisonous snakes or bugs. And I looked around in the jungle and said, what is a nice doctor like me doing in the rainforest of Ecuador? And that brought me to my journey and my reason for being there, which was that um, about six years ago now or more, I um, came into the bathroom and found my um, seven-year-old son having a seizure on the bathroom floor. And obviously, that was terrifying. And because I was a pediatric neurologist and already very much an expert, not just in medicine, but also in herbal medicine and in nutrition and in food and in mind-body, and I had people who I treated from all over the world who came to see me, at that time, I, I was the expert that probably people would have sent my son to for healing. And at the same time in that moment, I knew with all my heart that I did not have the answers to help him and that I was gonna have to go on my own journey to find not just something that would help him, but also something that was going to help many of the people in the world right now who are very much in my practice and also all around me, I tend to treat the sensitive people, the canaries in the coal mine, the ones who feel things more deeply and perceive things more deeply um, than many of the other people. And there in Ecuador, I, well, before I came to Ecuador, in fact, I found the person who presented themselves to me, right? Because as soon as you kind of open your mind or open your intention to find a teacher, of course they appear, they make themselves known to you. And my teacher was a um, PhD in ethnobotany who also was a fourth generation shaman. And she invited me to Ecuador to learn about plants. And of course, I learned about this cutting edge and very ancient way of healing. So I already knew a lot about herbal medicine. And we know that, in fact, the word drug is means actually to dry. It's from a term that means to dry, and that's because our first medicines were plants. And plants heal us in many, many ways. They heal us through sensory contact. They heal us through the food that we eat and um, nourishing us. They heal us through experiencing awe and gratitude and connection to place, to nature, to our culture, to our memories, and to ancient memory. So of course, we, most of us understand, I think, at this point, that we have a very deep connection to plants through food, right? And food is something we integrate. We literally integrate these plants into our own bodies. And in fact, what we know now is that they don't just influence us by giving us nutrition, but they influence us literally down to the level of our DNA and our epigenetics and the way our DNA is read. And it changes us and, in fact, heals us um, over generations. Does anybody here practice any kind of plant medicine or healing with plants? Anyone? OK, great. So have you ever given anybody flowers? Raise your hand. Have you ever received flowers? OK, so that's a form of plant medicine. How do you feel when you receive flowers? Good, right? 
it, why do we give plants to people? Why do we give flowers when we're celebrating? Why do we give flowers to people when we're in love? Why do we give flowers to people at times of grief? Because it changes how we feel. It transforms us and it heals us. So when we are in the process of exchanging plants or being in the presence of plants in that way, it changes us and it heals us and that is a form of plant medicine. What about going into the woods? Anybody here like to go into the woods? Okay, so it turns out that when you go into the woods, and there's this concept of forest bathing or shinrin-yoku that is a Japanese concept, but is very much practiced in, in East Asia and practiced really by everybody in the world, but there it's been studied very um, objectively. And what has been found is that people who are um, immersing themselves in the beauty of the forest on a regular basis have increased creativity, better executive function, better memory, better sleep, um, more focus, and more than that, and they're happier, they also have measured different kinds of physiologic findings and have found that anti-cancer proteins are increased in our body. We produce more anti-cancer proteins. We produce more natural killer cells. Um, these are things that protect us from infection and from cancer. So we're actually in a process of healing simply by walking through the forest and immersing ourselves in the beauty of the forest. There's no drug that does that. There's nothing, nothing that we know of that we can give to people in our human way that heals us in that manner. What about plant medicine? Anybody here drink coffee? <laughs> so coffee is a bitter tonic made from plants. It's a plant tonic. And people seem to really love it. <laughs> from what I can see. Chocolate too, right? Anybody here drink tea? I'm in a British crowd, so. Okay, and tea is another way of plant medicine. Even essential oils, which have gotten into kind of a very woo category, have a tremendous amount of scientific literature showing that um, not just does it change how we feel, you can just smell the scent of rosemary essential oil, or indeed rosemary itself, and it improves your memory up to 60% for a period of time after that. Lavender actually can make you feel more relaxed and more joyful. And this has been measured, but also there's a tremendous amount of data showing that essential oils um, heal wounds that are antibiotic resistant. What I learned though on this trip to Ecuador was that there was a whole nother category that I had always been very connected with but had very much shut down um, in the world of plants, which is the magic of plants. And that's not a very accepted area of discussion and certainly not in the scientific world. But there they use plants for cleaning, right? So using smudges like Palo Santo or sage, they use plants as protection. This is a picture of uh, actually Wairuro seeds, which are used as a form of protection. And these are all about relationships. Plants are used for transformation. This is achote paste. And the achote is painted onto people um, as a way of changing them. So if they have depression, or if they have PTSD, or if they have experienced sexual assault, things like that, where they're holding trauma in their bodies, plants are used in various ways to transform them and heal them. And we're learning now, right, that there are a lot of plants that we thought might be, you know, that have be become illegal, you know, and we can talk about why that is another time, but we're learning that these plants have incredible healing properties that are not just physical, and, you know, I could talk about medical cannabis for a full day or longer, the science behind why it's healing on a physical level, but also things like magic mushrooms, psilocybin or ayahuasca, Okay, which are now very much in vogue, but have been around obviously for a very, very long time. And these are plants that don't necessarily have direct physical properties in terms of healing, but people are with one experience or a few experiences can um, heal from lifelong intractable depression and from PTSD and from suicidality and even from cancer and other kinds of physical conditions, although it's not changing their physical body in a physiologic way that can be measured. 
They're working on an emotional and spiritual level. And we have these master plants, we call them, teacher plants that are very powerful. All plants are teachers, but then there are these particular plants that are very, very strong, powerful plants. And coffee and chocolate would fall into that category, right? Because they kind of, they run the show, right? I mean, can you imagine if we took away coffee? I think the world might fall apart, actually. <laughs> you know? And, and yet, we have plants like coca, the coca plant. Right? And, and what happens when you come to plants and you're not in, a, in good relations with those plants, you're not showing up in a good way, then those plants, if they feel disrespected, can destroy you. So we came for like the coca plant, which in Ecuador, I chewed coca leaves because I get altitude sickness and we were going to high altitudes and it helped me tremendously. But the way that the coca plant has been treated you know, in Western society and really by the world is not respectful. And those plants will come to destroy you if they're not treated with respect. But plants teach us things that other things can't teach us. Um, other things outside of the natural world, awe, surrender, right? These are things that we don't have a good, a good language for, or a good way of learning. Um, in any kind of systematic way, but plants can teach you this through their medicine. And so how do we learn from plants? It's a different kind of knowledge. We have cerebral knowledge, but there's also this wordless knowledge. And you heard a little bit about that from Susan, because she was talking about how you can hear things, right, without really hearing them with your ears. They're, you're sensing, right? So this wordless knowledge, there's indigenous knowledge, which is, which is transmitted over over centuries and through memories and lots of different ways that, that are through nature. There's collective knowledge, things that we all know deep down. And there's heart intelligence. And I want to talk for a minute about the heart as an intelligent organ, OK? So the heart has an electromagnetic field that is measurable. And it's actually a field that is hundreds of times more, hundreds of thousands of times, in fact, more powerful than the electromagnetic field of the brain. And this electromagnetic field, which is irradiating through the body, also connects to other people's electromagnetic fields around us, and not just people. And you might know this because let's say you're sitting in your living room and you know a friend walks in, or a roommate or a partner walks in, and they're in a bad mood, they had a bad day. They might not say, I had a bad day. They might not even do anything except walk in the door and suddenly you feel different. And you know, uh oh, <laughs> you know, it's something which we feel before we ever actually um, are told. So the heart is really an organ of perception and communication. And the way that our eyes see waves and frequencies as color, the heart perceives these waves and frequencies as emotions. And the heart and the brain are synchronized, but in fact, what we see here in that little spot. This is so blurry up here, but um, you see before the brain knows that big spike, there's a little spike. That's the heart, the heart showing a difference before the brain ever knows. So before the brain perceives things, the heart perceives things. The heart knows things first. And this, there's a whole lot of data about that in terms of even like, you know, precognition, knowing things before they happen. So that's a whole very beautiful other topic. But what we do know is that through heart rate variability, which is a, a way that we measure um, the difference uh, in space between beats of the heart, um, we can know people's moods by up to 80% accuracy, whether someone is sad or angry or um, agitated, anxious, right, or feeling calm we can actually predict, based on heart rate variability, their actual emotions. And we can see when someone is in an incoherent state, um, which would be um, when they're kind of basically out of sync, okay, what we would call out of sync, versus if they're in a state of coherence. And that is really measured um, during periods of appreciation and gratitude. So our cells actually entrain or synchronize with each other. Our organs synchronize with each other. So the heart and the brain 
our hearts synchronize with each other, so my heart and your heart. And when I'm standing here, actually, at least six feet, if not farther away, you are experiencing the electromagnetic field of my heart, and I am experiencing the electromagnetic field of your heart, and we have a shared electromagnetic field. And also, it can be that this is with any organism. It does not have to be another person. So everything has an electromagnetic field. Animals, plants, and anything in the Earth. The Earth obviously has its own very, very powerful electromagnetic field. And this means that our energy attunes to any part of our body, and our energy can attune, attune and harm, harmonize with other people's energetic fields and other beings' energetic fields. And this is just a beautiful example of how the heart rate variability between a boy and his dog synchronize. Mm -hmm. And so at any time, and this comes from me as a scientist, we're entangled, right? And this is called biopoetics, but it's also quantum physics, right? That we cannot be separate from the things that we're observing. We can only understand living beings through the aliveness that we share with them. And plants are complex living beings that we've evolved with over thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And there are things called plant signatures, right? There's this whole beautiful world of plant signatures. How do we communicate with plants? How do, how do plants communicate with us? Well, let's say, you know, we can look at one plant and find that, let's say, dandelion, people use all over the world. People who never communicated, indigenous communities who didn't have airplanes and didn't have boats know that dandelion is helpful for certain kinds of healing, and it's used like that all over the world. How, did it, how do we know that? It's not just random trial and error because that would have taken, I mean, that would have taken much, much longer and the chances of that statistically ever working would be almost impossible, if not impossible. Plants have signatures in the way that they look that teach us about the healing properties of plants. So here you see a walnut and the way it was opened, you see that it looks like a heart and walnuts are very healing for the heart. And you see here these different forms of the walnuts. So the first one looks like a skull and that's because walnut is actually very healing for the brain. The next one is actually um, related to testicles. It's a very important uh, medicine for testicles and fertility. The next one is like two chambers of, is like two of the chambers of the heart. And the last one is wor like worms. And walnut is used actually um, for black walnut hull. The hull is used for, for deworming. And I'm gonna probably skip to this a little because I'm so uh, short on time, but, but like, what does this look like to you? What part of our bodies might this look like? Skin. skin, right? So comfrey actually has these little cells and tiny hairs that look like human skin, and it's one of the greatest skin healers. And rose um, and dandelion through their colors, so rose is very important heart medicine and blood medicine. Dandelion, very important for bile and liver and gallbladder. Um, I'm gonna kind of skip through this a little bit. Trees, which I wrote about a little bit in the abstract for this talk, um, actually live in communities. And they do best in their ancient forest communities that are untouched where they create microclimates to protect each other from different kinds of weather conditions. And they raise their young in a particular way where the, the um, canopy of trees prevents light from coming through so that the, the baby trees grow more slowly so that they end up being stronger and denser and more protected from wild weather. Um, so ultimately what it comes down to is connecting the science and the sacred. And the sacred exists in confluences through connection of consciousness, through connection of energetic fields, connections across all beings and all these synergies. Um, and I think what I'd just like to close with is, you know, two little tiny bits. One is, um, you know, sort of similar to Susan's story. Um, these experiences that we have where we have true, I can have true communication with plants, which we all can have. One of them was I was walking in the woods, which I do almost every day, um, and I was praying. And I said, you know, please show me how I can help support you and how I can help to do the work that we need to do together. And I looked down, and right in front of me, there was a um, bark that was sh shaped like a sword, right on the ground like this. It was huge. I'd never seen anything like it before, and I picked it up and like 
you know, held it and it felt very much like this message from the trees that were there um, kind of saying, we, we're gonna support you. We're gonna help you in this, in this mission that you have. And lastly, um, in Santa Fe, where actually we, John, Susan and I all met in person for the first time, um, I went and sat with a tree and the tree spoke to me, not in words, but in the same way that you kind of heard from Susan that you can hear things in, um, in your mind. And, and they do come in words or in images. And um, afterwards I wrote a poem and I'm gonna read the poem to close um, from the message that I got from the tree. Sometimes I know I was once a rock and I remember I can speak to trees and I understand perfectly the language of the wind whispering to the leaves. Sometimes the earth sings to me in her mother tongue, a language more ancient than words. She says that my suffering is hers and hers is mine. When together we weep, the tears from my heart become her stormy ocean, her wild rains. They wash clean her parched breast and she bursts into blossom and rainbow. She is me, I am she, and together we heal. Thank you.